Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to another uh, Shouts the Kids webinar. I don't know how many we're on anymore. I've stopped counting, um, but we've got lots more coming uh, next week and today and tomorrow as well. Um, but for today, I'm really excited to introduce Alex. Um, she's a PhD student at the University of Minnesota, Manitoba, sorry, um, and in Canada, that is. And she's studying shark physiology. So hormones, stress hormones, all of these things. She's going to tell us all about it. Um, so why don't you introduce yourself a little bit further um, and then get, we can get started. Perfect. So I'll start sharing that. Okay. Awesome. So I'm Alex, and again, I'm from the University of Manitoba, which is in Winnipeg, Canada. It's actually right in the middle of Canada. Um, and I wanted to start by just saying that how excited I am to be here and how excited I am to present. And that I actually, um, as a high schooler, as well as a college student, followed Sharks for Kids. And uh, now I get to be here and share my research with everyone here. So um, I guess the moral of that story is that if you're interested in something, you can actually do it, which is super, super fun, super awesome. Um, cool. So uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about shark physiology and particularly how we can use physiology, and I'll explain what that is, how we can use physiology as a tool for conservation and protecting sharks. So what is conservation? So conservation for me is three different things. It is the protection of a species from extinction, it is restoring ecosystems and habitats so that uh, those animals can live there and thrive, and then also preserving diversity and services. So what services is, is basically every animal has a, a different job in their ecosystem, a different job in their habitat. We wanna make sure that all those jobs are filled and not only all those species are thriving, but all those jobs are getting done. Yeah. So shark distributions are worldwide, and I have a, uh, a map of three different sharks over here on the right. So hammerhead sharks, whale sharks, and great white sharks. You can see that their distributions are all over the place, all over the oceans. And what that really means is that conservation is a global issue, and that your local impacts can actually affect sharks all over the world. So what you do at home affects sharks across the world, across the globe. So there are many different kinds of sharks. So we have uh, great white sharks, which I have a picture of here, which are pelagic sharks, meaning they swim in the open ocean. Epaulette sharks, which is another shark I've worked with, and those are benthic reef sharks, which means that they walk along, they actually do walk, they walk along on the bottom of the reef system, and they eat things on the bottom of the reef system. Uh, we have a ninja lantern shark, which is a deep sea shark. It's very small, it's a deep sea shark. A uh, spiny dogfish, which is the, uh, one of the fish that I work with, and I'll get more on that later, but that also is a, a, a bottom dweller, so it eats things on the bottom of the ocean. And then we also have the shark's relatives, so that includes stingrays and skates. And what I want to hone in here is that um, all different, uh, all, all of these species you're uh, managing them in the way that uh, dictates their physiology and they're all different. And so that's what I'm gonna get to a little bit. So why are sharks important? Why do we care about sharks? So first, they eat other animals. And you can see here, they, are, they can be the top of the food chain, they can be in the middle of the food chain. And most importantly, they eat sick and dead animals, which means that they can recycle those nutrients back into the actual ecosystem. They also control populations of prey species. So you can imagine these fish right at the bottom, these blue and green fish at the bottom, uh, if they eat coral in this system and their populations got out of control, then they might eat too much coral and they might lose habitat. But for sharks are really important because they control that, that population so that they can preserve the ecosystem, preserve the coral. And it really is just a balance between all these animals together. Again, sharks recycle nutrients. So instead of sick and de dead animals potentially just sitting on the bottom of the ocean um, decaying, sharks actually eat those animals and then they recycle them back. And that waste, their waste from eating those animals fertilizes the environment further. 
And they also remove animals that don't belong in that ecosystem. So you can see this fish here called a lionfish, and it's an invasive species in a lot of parts of the world. And what sharks do is they actually eat those fish and they remove them from the environment so that they can't cause further problems. However, unfortunately, uh, according to the IUCN Red List, which is an international body that grades the endangerment of different species, one in four and one in three sharks and their relatives are at risk of extinction. Uh, why are they at risk? The two major reasons are fishing pressure by humans. So the top picture so shows accidental fishing pressure, which is called bycatch, and actually 3.3 million sharks are caught due to bycatch every year and then actually targeted fishing. So the bottom picture shows all these different fins that have been taken from sharks that were actually targeted. The other reason why they're endangered is actually the ocean is heating up, as I'm sure you've heard. Um, the ocean is warming at an unprecedented rate, and that's largely due to an increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that's, that's something that us as scientists need to figure out how sharks are dealing with. Like we need to understand what, what these changes are doing to their bodies and what they're doing to their long-term survival. So why are sharks so vulnerable to these uh, stressors? So they're long-lived and slow-growing. So for example, we have the Greenland shark over here, which has recently been shown to be between 400 and 500 years old. So it's a long time. So they're adapted to a specific habitat. And if their habitat is changing, then they're gonna be vulnerable. Also sharks uh, take a long time to produce babies and not many of those survive. So the, over here we have again the spiny dogfish which has a pregnancy of 18 to 24 months, which is a really long time to be pregnant. And then they only give birth to about 10 to 12 babies, a lot of which don't actually survive. And then finally, some species move a lot, move often, um, so, for example, the whale shark can cross the entire Pacific Ocean, and that means that they're using multiple ecosystems and multiple habitats that we need to think about when we're protecting these habitats and saving them for conservation. So again, the major conservation threats to sharks um, are fishing pressure as well as climate change. And again, as a scientist, I think about, okay, what are the actual parameters that I need to measure in order to um, inform how fishing pressure and conservation or climate change is affecting conservation. And for me in my work, I look at two major things. I look at air exposure and temperature. And you can imagine a shark is getting air exposed and they can't, no fish can breathe out of the water. So they can't breathe in the air. They're getting air exposed during that fishing pressure, during that accidental fishing pressure. And then also, uh, in, again, increasing temperature. The ocean is warming. And so we want to know how are the sharks dealing with an, a warming environment. And what we do in order to do that is study something called physiology. So physiology is the study of the processes that keep living things alive and thriving. So in the human body, you can imagine it's everything from the things that are going on in your brain to stuff that's going in your blood, um, your, how your muscles are working, how you're actually breathing in and out. All of that is your physiology. And same thing with sharks. It is largely affected by the environment, meaning that our environment as well as sharks' environments can largely affect how their physiology is working and thriving. And we can measure those changes in physiology before and after we ch have changes in the environment. So for example, if we change uh, an environmental variable such as temperature, if we increase the temperature, we can actually measure those changes in physiology before we increase temperature and after we increase temperature. So different uh, physiological factors that we can look at um, on the outside are examples such as growth or color, um, escape response of an animal. And sharks, what you do is you can actually uh, grab their tail and they will dart away from you. You can see how fast and what direction they're moving, as well as what they're eating and how much waste they're producing. And externally, or sorry, internally, you can also measure things uh, to determine physiology. And that is uh, examples like energy, so how much nutrients or how much energy is an animal getting from their food, uh, what's, in your, what's in the blood, how different organs are functioning, such as, how diff uh, such as muscles, so how your muscles are functioning or how your brain is functioning. Again, nutrients. 
And then what I study is actually signaling inside the body. So um, that is done by a molecule, molecules called hormones, which largely originate from the brain and then go around the body and tell the body what to do at different times. So again, what I study is the stress response and energy balance. So largely that is those signaling molecules and those energy molecules and how they interact with each other. So again, the stress response in humans, we could uh, use an example such as taking a test. So when you take a test, your stomach might feel a little bit funny and your hands might feel a little bit clammy and um, your heart's beating a little bit faster. So that's, the act, that's a stress response in action. And what that, actually, what, what that actually is, is the increase in hormones. So you have increase in signaling molecules that tell your body what to do to either confront that stressor or run away from that stressor. And hopefully during a test, you're confronting that stressor. And what hormones, one of the things that hormones do is actually change energy molecules. And largely, they're going to increase energy molecules so they have the fuel to confront or run away from that stressor. And then lastly, uh, you're going to have a change in behavior and then overall health. And then when we're talking about conservation of a species, we're looking at that overall health, how the stress response is dealing with that overall health of an organism. And you can imagine if you're exposed to a stressor long term, then it might have a detrimental effect on your health. So the same thing happens in sharks. So again, their stressors that we're looking at are fishing pressures as well as climate change. And they also experience an increase in hormones, increase in those signaling molecules, and they largely experience an increase in those energy molecules, and then a change in the overall behavior and health. So just looking a little bit more closely at those energy molecules, all animals need to intake energy through their food, and then that's going to go towards either work or storage. So work is the actual process of running or jumping or swimming if you're a shark or a human. And then storage is when you don't actually need that energy immediately and you can store it in different parts of your body. However, during the stress response, a large part of, that ener of those energy molecules goes towards work rather than storage. And in fact, a large part of the stored energy molecules get mobilized inside the, the blood of an animal and go towards more work. So you can imagine that can get exhausting really, really fast. So the two study sites that I, I've worked in, um, one is on the uh, west coast of Canada in a cooler coastal environment. And then the other is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in French Polynesia, which is a very different environment, is a warm uh, coral reef environment. So again, two very different environments, two very different sharks that we're talking about here. But you can imagine their physiology is similar and you can make comparisons between their physiologies. So the first site is a place called Banfield. It's a town called Banfield on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. If you don't know, don't know where that is, that is right above Washington State. So we work at a place called the Banfield Marine Science Center, which is conveniently located right on the Pacific Ocean. And here we go fishing every night for North Pacific spiny dogfish. Um, on the right, you can see a large version. It's not a, not a real dogfish jumping in the boat, but it is a larger version so you can see what it looks like. And you can see me here in the middle holding a spiny dogfish that we've just caught. And you can see the size of it. So they're pretty small, actually. They're not that big in comparison to other sharks. And the importance of studying these animals is that they are abundant. They're not endangered species. And we can learn a lot about shark physiology just, just because they're accessible. We can bring them back to the lab and we can manipulate different environmental factors and then learn what's going on with these sharks. So here's me back in the lab and each one of these sharks get their, their own little box, their own little place to live while they're in the lab. And what I can do is actually expose them to a stressor and then take blood samples before and after their exposure. So in these fish, we've actually air exposed them. So if you, again, you can imagine you have that fishing pressure and then you take a fish out of the water, they're gonna get air exposed. And we can take blood samples before and after that exposure and see what's the difference in those energy molecules before and after. And also what's really cool is that we can actually inject those signaling molecules directly into the shark. Again, those are called hormones. You can take blood samples before and after 
we, that injection and we can look, okay, what's going on with the energy molecules when I've actually introduced a hormone, introduced a signaling molecule into the shark. And I just want to remind you that under normal circumstances, we expect that energy, that energy intake to either go to work or storage. And under stressful circumstances, such as air exposure or such as introducing that signaling molecule, we expect that a lot more of those energy molecules are going to be released into the blood so that there's more molecules in order to go to work rather than storage. So what we can do is actually measure directly how many how the concentration of energy molecules in the blood of different samples from these sharks. So you can see on the bottom right uh, what's called a plate assay. And plate assays can me measure many different things, but here it's actually measuring energy molecules. So you can see on the right side of the plate, there's clear wells, and there's actually samples in those wells, and that means that there's no detectable readings of any energy molecules. So the shark wasn't mobilizing energy. So we think, okay, the shark might not be that much stress, might not be that under that much stress. However, on the left side of the plate, we see these dark blue wells, which means that there's a lot of large concentration of energy molecules in those wells. And that, that fish was probably a little bit stressed out. So we can see the difference before and after we introduce those stressors. On the top left, I just have, I included a picture of what a shark hormone actually is. So we have been able to make, or we are trying to make shark hormones in the lab. And this is actually in the process of making shark hormones. So we can actually inject that back into the shark and then see what happens with their energy molecules. So what can we learn from all this? So first of all, again, spiny dogfish are a model species, meaning they're abundant and we can access them readily and they're not endangered. And we can compare their physiology to other shark species that we may not be able to get a hold of as easily. So we can learn how sharks are handling stress under a controlled setting. And that's important because, again, this is a lab setting. And in the wild, things are going to be a little different. They're going to experience their habitat a little differently, and they're going to experience those stressors a little differently. We can learn generally how the stress response is reacting and how those energy molecules are working in a simulated environment. And we can also learn the relationship between those energy and hormone molecules. And again, we can apply that to other sharks. So that's important in our next part because we are heading to the Pacific Ocean where uh, in French Polynesia, where they have the largest shark sanctuary in the world. And what that means is that there are little to no fishing pressures in this area. However, they have strong uh, temperature pressures because this, is, this island is right near the equator. And that means that the water here is already warm. So any increases in water temperature due to climate change is really going to impact the animals that live here. So the island that we works on is called Morea, French Polynesia. And you can see around the island these light blue areas, which are actually coral reefs. And in these coral reefs, um, sharks go in and they have their babies. And so all these areas around the island are called nurseries for baby sharks. So what we can actually do is go into those nurseries and catch those baby sharks and take them back into the lab. We're not able to do as invasive uh, physiology experiments on them because they are protected and they are an endangered species. So that's where it's really important to use another model species in order to make comparisons between these animals and make inferences that we may not have been able to make earlier. So the sharks we targeted here are called black tip reef sharks. And so here's a baby shark down in the corner. And we first take their weight and their measurements and just everything before we take them to the lab. And so here are a few uh, baby black tip reef sharks in their home in the lab and they get a giant tank where they can swim around in. And what we can do with that tank is we actually increase the temperature of the water over time. And then again, we can take blood samples before and after we have those temperature changes and see how their energy molecules are affected by this. So again, I just want to uh, remind you that under normal circumstances, we have energy going towards work and storage, but under stressful circumstances, we have more energy going towards work and less of it going towards storage. So the other thing we want to know here is that what happens when there are multiple stressors? So 
in the wild, sharks are going to experience many different stresses all at once, not just fishing pressure, not just increasing temperature, although those, those are very important. Baby sharks in particular are, are little, they might have predators, and they're running away from their predators, so that's a stressor. And they also need to eat, so finding food is an additional stressor. So we wanted to see what could actually happen when we have two or more stressors happen at once. So what we did is we actually air exposed these baby sharks and then we increased the water temperature as well and we took blood samples before and after. Another experiment in the wild and we captured adult black tip reef sharks and we took blood samples from them after five minutes of holding and then they were released. This can tell us key information between the difference in the stress response and the difference in that energy mobilization between babies and adults. And that's really important in terms of conservation because these animals utilize different habitats and sometimes utilize the same reef habitat, but largely util utilize different habitats. And if their stress responses are different, then we're gonna have to manage them differently and protect different habitats differently. So what can we learn from this experiment? So the first thing is how sharks handle temperature stress, again, in a controlled setting. So that's a controlled setting in the lab. And uh, of course, the wild is going to be very different, but we can kind of infer what's going to happen based on our experiments in the lab. And then on top of that, we have the effect of multiple stressors. So again, these sharks are dealing with so many things in the wild, and we want to know how are they going to perform? How is their, how, how is their physiology going to change when they're exposed to many different stressors. So I just want to finish on basically saying that scientists can only do so much. So we go out into the field and we're able to handle all these animals and uh, study them hands-on, um, but that is largely impacted by many different things, including policy, um, personal activism, as well as nonprofit groups. And what they want us to do does influence what scientists can do. However, that is totally influenced by you. You influence policy, you are the activists, and you influence what nonprofits get funded or not. And that's so important because that means that you have a direct link to scientists and what we study. So if you're interested in this, you, need, you can get involved and you can tell us what you want us to study and what is important to you. So what are little things you can do to help in order to get that message across? So the first thing is buy a local. So that means that you, um, you buy things in your hometown or you buy things in your home state or wherever you are. And that means that you don't have to order things from abroad, which more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere because those things have to be shipped either by a plane or uh, by a truck or something like that. But even better, reusing and recycling things. This house, finding new uses for things. You don't even need to buy anything new. You don't even need to release that CO2. And then also supporting local and global conservation efforts. So I have a few on the side here, some of my favorites. Um, Association for Zoos and Aquariums, just making sure that your local zoo is accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, because that means that they have a hands-on breeding program and a species survival plan for a lot of these species and a lot of other species that I haven't even talked about as well as the World Wildlife Fund and the Ocean Conservancy, which do great work, as well as Sharks for Kids, which does great work for uh, shark species particularly. And then finally, probably the most important thing is to educate and learn. So the more you learn, the more you can tell people why these animals matter, and the better you can, you, you, you can actually provide information and you can do more for them. Um, and it's just fun to learn new things as well. So on that, I just want to thank you for coming to my talk, and I want to thank Sharks for Kids for letting me talk, and I will gladly answer any of your questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alex. That was really interesting, and we've got some great questions coming through. Um, the last things you said about how people can, can help is um, really important, and we get asked a lot, how can I help sharks? And people don't always realize that what you do in your day-to-day -day life, you know, the things you buy, the food you eat, um, where you buy things and, and how you travel, all of these things actually help sharks uh, indirectly and directly as well, because 
if you're making sure that you're not putting as much uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, if you're not using as much plastic, all of these things are going to help sharks in the end. So mm. definitely really important. Um, and, and we will often get asked about how people can help. Um, and then it, so, so a lot of people were asking about what happens to the sharks. You, you, you take them into the lab. Do they then get released afterwards? Um, and does the, does, do the experiments have any lasting effects on the sharks? Right. So that's a really good question. So in marine sharks are released back into the wild. So you can see on this picture right here, that is actually us releasing one of the baby sharks back into the wild. And we actually will recapture a lot of these sharks. So we know that these experiments are not having a, a, a discernible long lasting effect on them. And we can retest them. We can actually see over the years what is happening to these sharks. And a lot of the time, um, what we do is so short term that they don't have any effects on them. Um, and it's, it's super fun to see them swim away and just see, okay, I, uh, I've taken this animal and I've done an experiment on it and now I can see it swim away and the next year I can see that it, which is awesome. Amazing. Yeah. Sharks are really resilient animals. And yeah. so, um, and, and they, they're so resilient because they've been evolving over millions of years. So, um, people are often worried about what's, what the things that we do to sharks might, ha might do to sharks. And actually, um, they recover really well from all of these things. And in fact, it's kind of like you, after, t after you take that test at school, you might be stressed during the test, but after your, the test, after you get released from the class, you're very relieved and, and that stress disappears. So it's kind of the same with, the, with yeah. sharks, really. And you can totally imagine a shark being the same way because initially they may not eat or they, they um, may be a little lethargic, may be a little tired, but then after a few hours, they will totally find they start eating again and they start swimming around and act like normal sharks again. Um, so the other question that we've had and, and kind of leading on to that is how long does it take for a shark to adapt to a new environment? Oh, that's also a really good question. Um, that depends on the environment. So we have seen some ab adaptations to temperature, at least in the studies that I've done. Um, and that probably has been over years, over many, many years um, of living in that environment. The problem is we're seeing such a drastic change in these stressors, particularly temperature, so fast that sharks and other animals aren't able to deal with that as quickly. It's important to, to mitigate while we can, to make sure that we protect these habitats while we can, because that means that you're reducing the number of, of stressors that a shark might encounter in a given day. So uh, for example, the, the, the French Polynesian shark sanctuary, um, the sharks are not experiencing that fishing stress. So that's really important because they're not getting that additional stress on top of an already warming home, essentially. Great. Right. Um, um, so the next question would be, um, well, actually, let's go with an easy one. Maybe it's not easy. Not everyone finds this one easy, but what's your favorite shark? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's so difficult. I, I like epaulette sharks a lot. So that was one of the pictures I showed earlier. Um, I worked with epaulette sharks in uh, Dr. Jody Rummer's lab. She's based at James Cook University um, in Australia. And they're just so cute. They have fins that are flat and they walk along the reef. Literally, they walk along the reef uh, and they eat little worms in the, in the sand and everything. And they're just so cute to watch and they're super, super smart. They, they can survive a lot, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, it's, it's one of the sharks that we love taking as an example in Sharks for Kids to show how they can walk along the reef yeah. um, and go from one, one rock pool to another. And, and even when they're underwater, they just sit on the sand and walk along. That oh, and that's also just an example of a shark that can tolerate that, that air exposure as well. Like they can walk, walk on land for a little bit in order to get to another pool of water, which is incredible that yeah. some, some of these species already have ways to deal with these stressors. Yeah. 
And, and speaking of dealing with stress, um, Claudia asks, she's heard that if you flip a shark upside down, it might help it keep it calm and, and reduce stress on it. Um, how does that work and is it true? Yeah, so that's called tonic immobility. And that is true um, for some species of sharks. And it does, it just, it totally makes them calm. And we do that in order to take blood samples. And um, when we're out in the field and we're dealing with bigger sharks, it's actually a safety issue where we have to flip them over to make sure that the shark is safe, but also that we're safe. And we can take a blood sample from that shark. And it doesn't seem to affect them once they're flipped back over. So once they're flipped upright, they will dart away as fast as they can. So it's just, it's kind of like they're falling asleep a little bit and you can um, experiment and you can do different things. And then as soon as they're flipped upright, they can swim away. Great. Um, and um, we have a lot of uh, people watching, um, whether it's children or maybe young adults who are um, interested in going into a career in marine biology, in, in shark science, for example. And so a lot of them want to know if you have any advice for them. What's your advice for children? What's your advice for teenagers um, who, who might want to go into this career? So if you're that, I love talking about that because I, I kind of fell into this by accident. So I was, I was very interested in sharks. I've always loved the ocean. I grew up ocean um, on the Atlantic Ocean and it was just something that I was always interested in and I just started taking every opportunity I could that I could find with uh, different ocean species not even sharks just different species and I actually had a job where um, again somehow got this job where I ended up opportunistically working with sharks it wasn't part of my job <laughs> i just wanted to work with sharks so my my leaders at the in this position kind of manipulated away because i was so passionate about it manipulated away so that i was able to work with sharks not directly but using blood samples and uh, looking at the different things in their blood and then through that connection i was able to find a phd um, in sharks. So I guess my biggest advice is that if you're interested in, in it, don't stop being interested and just go for it. Absolutely go for it. Find the opportunities. Um, there's, there's so many things you can do. Just um, even as a kid, there's so many opportunities you can take. Um, I know that there's a uh, many field sites will, will take on local kids and will help, will let them participate in their experiments. So um, in Morea, a lot of the time we will, uh, there'll be field trips that will come and they can see what we're doing and explain to them what we're doing. And we've actually had people in the high schools there um, come to our field sites and actually catch sharks with us. So I think that's the biggest thing is take every opportunity that you possibly can. Yeah, I think, I think that's definitely, definitely really important. And people don't always realize that you don't have to go very far to get those opportunities very often. And, and it, even if it's something to do with uh, finding the species, the wildlife species in your back garden, um, it might not seem like it's going to help you to study sharks one day, but it definitely will um, because you're getting used to how scientists do things and you're, you're learning all of the scientific methods that you can start doing that as a kid. So all of those, we call them citizen science projects and there's lots going around. Um, and so those are one of, one of the things that children from a really young age can get involved with. Um, and then as you grow older, there's, you know, opportunities with your local aquariums. Um, uh, and just by going and talking to people, you know, you might find that there's um, events going on at your aquarium where people come and give presentations. And all of these things mean that you get to meet more and more people and you can learn lots. And at the same time, you can meet people that can give you these opportunities. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, and we've got a couple more questions about your experiments. Um, Kifa asks, what's the highest and lowest temperatures that you were looking at um, for the sharks? Experiment? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so on average, we were looking at 29 degrees Celsius. So that is around, trying to convert a little bit, <laughs> that is around um, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 80 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Uh, and the highest temperature that I looked at was 31 degrees Celsius. So that's only two degrees different Celsius. And we saw a lot of changes in their energy metabolites with only, or energy molecules with only two degrees difference. Um, we haven't looked beyond that. So that is actually something that we need to do because we were taking environmental as well sharks. And because these baby sharks are in the shallows of those reefs, where the temperature of the water is gonna increase much faster than in the open ocean, sometimes we would read temperatures around 34 degrees Celsius, which is much higher than temperatures that I've experimented with, but there were sharks swimming around, um, which really speaks to the versatility as well from sharks um, and the resiliency of sharks. Uh, so yeah, so the answer I guess is 31 degrees Celsius, but ideally I wanna look higher and, and see what we can answer with those questions as well. And how, how do you choose, like, why do you choose these temperatures? Um, so they are environmentally relevant temperatures that we choose. That's something uh, that, I guess, the difference between the field sites as well and the difference between the sharks I use. So um, with the spiny dogfish, we're able to really push those fish uh, kind of their extremes, essentially, uh, because they are so resilient and we're able to use I guess, technically non-environmentally relevant um, parameters. However, if you are working with a species that is in a environment that is warming, you wanna make sure that you use temperatures that make sense. So temperatures that you could see um, actual climate change um, increasing to that degree, um, because otherwise you're just pushing a shark to their extreme and you don't know oh, does this mean anything? Does, is this important for anything? Um, but then when if you use a temperature that, okay, the water of the temperature on average could increase to this degree within the next hundred years, um, then, there's a, then there's a reason for you to study that temperature. Fascinating. Um, okay, so I think that pretty much wraps up a lot of uh, the questions that have been um, uh, that, that people have been asking. So thank you so much, Alex, for joining us and for telling us all ab about your experiments and your research. Um, it's been really interesting and it's been really relevant because yesterday was Earth Day um, and Earth Day this year, the theme was climate action because uh, as we all know, climate change is one of the most pressing, if not the most pressing issue of our times. Um, so your research is really relevant when it comes to climate change and understanding how it's going to affect our oceans. Um, and so thank you so much for all the tips you've given us uh, on how we can help and how um, children can help. Um, and uh, we hope to see you again soon and we look forward to following all of your research. Thank you. No, I appreciate this so much. And I, I really, it really means a lot to me to be able to uh, share my work and share with everyone here. Yeah. Um, and before we go, is there any social media that uh, maybe people can follow your research or any websites or anything that they can come and find more, find out more? Yeah, so I actually didn't include it. Um, on the bottom of this page is uh, uh, the Physio Shark, which is um, all the research that we, uh, that's, been, that's been done in Morea, so all the French Polynesian research. Um, my Instagram, I don't have here, but <laughs> just Alex N. Schoen, so just by name. Um, and then there should be a website coming from my lab soon, <laughs> but that is in the process of being created. But that's more on the, um, the, the Canadian side, so the Canadian shark side. So depending on what you're interested, there's, there's different ways to reach out. Great. And people can go and find, uh, I think, the link to some of those on the Sharks for Kids website, yeah. along with lots of other lots of other resources, including fact sheets, um, coloring pages. Uh, there's a great coloring page on there uh, on all the things that you can do to help sharks. Um, so definitely go and check out our website. It's sharksforkids.com. And you can find all of the other uh, webinars at sharksforkids.com forward slash webinars. Thank you again, Alex. Awesome. Have a lovely day. You too. Thank you so much. Bye.